Put your hands together for Mr. Tony Wyatt. Anthony Joshua. In 2011, so before the London Olympics, Josh was found with a sports bag full of cannabis on a car next in, on the car seat. It was basically a prove you're a drug dealer starter kit. There are reason, as an Arsenal fan and an England fan, that you decided not to charge the multi-millionaire Premier League Arsenal England player Jack Wilshere <laughs> with this offence that he clearly started. So you're like the, the Ghostbusters of Barristers. They're like, who are you going to call? <laughs> Tony Wyatt. <laughs> and the prosecutor says, oh no no, it's just 62 tons. And I just said, I'm sorry, what would have been the biggest drug case in history? History. Generally, it's in the back of a lorry. It's on a boat. It's in a plane. It's a what a great way to catch criminals. Set up a company, tell the phone, it's unbreakable, let them get away with it for a couple of years, and then nick them up. Lose your phones, we've been breached. Oh, 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 the, the French, the French. What I do know is the craze weren't the craze. They, they were not the mafia. You read Dave Courtney's book, with no disrespect to the man, but he didn't do half the things he's claiming in the book. And I know that because I defended half the people who did. The podfather, Kiss the Ring, baby. I want to say a big thanks to all our sponsors. We love you. And without you, we wouldn't be able to make this amazing show. Big thank you to Dr. Green NFT for being one of our sponsors of the show. So the Dr. Green NFT project is coming out of Portugal and it's going to revolutionize the way that medical is transacted and distributed throughout the world. Thank you so much to Unisystems Freight UK, this amazing freight forwarding company. If you've got anything you need sending overseas, make sure you get in touch with the Unisystems Freight boys. If you want to learn any more about any of our amazing sponsors, make sure you check out the links in the description below. Welcome back to the Criminal Connection podcast. My name's Terry Stone, AKA the Podfather. Kiss the ring, baby. Um, I want to welcome a very special guest. We have one of the UK's leading criminal barristers. He's known as Tony Wyatt, but he also is a best-selling author who writes unbelievable books. If you haven't read one, um, you need to get on Amazon Order One now under the pseudonym of Tony Kent. So please put your hands together for Mr. Tony Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a better introduction than I've, than I've well, had for I'm, a long time. Yeah, you know, I just want to give that podfather, booth buffer type, you know, intro to the guests. But, Makes um, you start wanting to do this. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but no, Tony, thank you so much for coming on. No, thanks for having me. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, when I actually heard about um, you as an individual, I was just like, wow, this guy's got so many great stories. Um, and then when I found out that he was also a best-selling author, obviously you work in crime, but you also write about crime. So... I just thought you couldn't really ask for a better guest than uh, to, to, to come on our show. Well, well, I hope so anyway. <laughs> you can tell me that at the end. That's how it went. <laughs> um, but, but Tone, so, so obviously, you know, I take it you've always been in London, have you? You grew up in London. Yeah, I grew up in London. I grew up in North Oak, West, West London, um, North Oak, Uxbridge. I live out that way again now, but I've lived, I mean, I've lived everywhere in London, to be honest, for some reason over the years. I think the only place I've not been is East. Well, I'm South, so... You know, you're sort of west south, you know. But, yeah, I've done, yeah. I've done, yeah, I've done Fulham, Chelsea, uh, Islington, Exmouth Market, Clerkenwell, and then back, back right. home. <laughs> did you grow up in Norfolk? Norfolk, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was what, what was that like? I mean, you know, was you did you come from sort of like a middle class family, or was you no, like working class? No, my I, I come from a my family's predominantly Irish. Uh, my mum is one of seventeen kids. Wow. Um, so Irish Catholic goes without saying. I bet your ass is great at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it can be. Great might be one way of putting it. Lively, I think it's the, yeah. the other way of putting it. Uh, yeah, there's five of us. Um, I grew up in Northolt on a place called the Racecourse Estate, which was a council estate in Europe, uh, in Northolt. Uh, my mum and dad had the first three of us very young. Uh, dad was a builder, mum sort of housewife. And yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a typical barrister's upbringing. Right, okay. But but I take it, because um, I know when we spoke earlier, before you obviously come on, we, we, you, you obviously got into the boxing. So was that something you'd done, you know, literally because you was on an estate? And um, An element of that, I think, it, it's a family thing. Uh, everyone in the family has boxed at some point. Uh, but basically in our family, by the time you can toddle about, you know how to throw a left hook, know how to throw an overhand right. It's the kind of things that, that, that we, we just straight on the knees with the pads. My son is now five years old. Um, we might talk about what he's, where his mum's from later, but she comes yeah. from a very different background to me. She grew up in a stately home in Cheshire. Right, wow. uh, and yet my son, who's got this very genteel side to his background, <laughs> as well as my side to his background, as soon as he could walk, when he was two years old, he had his boxing gloves with his names on, he was jabbing, hooking, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So it's a big thing in the family. Yeah. Some of us took it further. Some of us took it more seriously than others. I took it more seriously. A couple of my cousins, my uncles, 
Uh, I mean, we're, we're related to some people who've won the British sort of Lonsdale belts and European titles and stuff like that. And it's all, all been to different levels. It's in your blood. It's very rare. <laughs> it's, it, it's in the blood. <laughs> and, uh, I think, to be honest, I think boxing played a huge part in, in my life going a different way to other members of the family. Because I've, you know, I've got members of the family who've been in and out of courts, in and out of prisons. My brother, his own experience is kind of what inspired me to be a barrister, but his experience on the other side of things. And I think the, one of the things that helped me in life, to be honest, was I spent my teenage years in a boxing club. So while other people are out fighting and you know, trying to trying to prove themselves in a pub, I had no need to do that because I was, you know, I was boxing, I was decent enough level. And I think that's kind of kept me on the straight and narrow. Uh, who knows? Who knows? But I, 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 do, I do attribute it to a certain amount of it to that. I only boxed as a kid because I got bullied and I was on a council estate. And that's why I was interested in in, in your story because yeah. a lot of kids do take up, you know, either got a karate or judo yeah. or boxing or kickboxing to, to, to learn to defend themselves. But that's why I got into it. But yeah. what I learned from it, um, you learn discipline. Um, you, you learn... Uh, you know, if you don't actually put the effort in, yeah. you are going to get hurt. And and I think it was it's, it's, for me. Um, there there was a you know lots of people when you talk about the old days, a lot of people say, oh, you know, they should put all these kids in the army for two years. Um, and obviously, when you was, I, I don't know if this was the seventies or the sixties, but when you just got to school, when you went in the gym, there was a boxing ring. Yeah. And and everyone would just box in the school. And uh, obviously they took that out of the school system. But I'm, I'm a big fan of that because I, I do look at the way the UK is at the moment. Yeah. And I do look at, uh, you know, and this isn't an excuse, right? But obviously, you know, if if people are on council estates and, and the parents split up and the kids are sort of kind of on their own mm. and the mum's out working and the kids left to their own devices – they are going to fall into crime. They are going to yep. get up to no good, just like we've all done when we were kids, you know. And I do think that the the boxing thing, I, I this might just sound, a lot of people might go, you know, what, what are you talking about? But I actually think they should actually p push it right to the front because I do think it would teach people respect, discipline, yep. and give them a focus rather than just hanging around on a council estate. You see a guy pull up in a nice car, a nice watch, nice necklace, and you go... I want what he's got. Yeah, I will come do this then. And then aspiring to the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. And in fact, it, it's it's actually undeniable. It's, it's not even a theory. It's undeniable. For example, there is a wonderful charity called Box Clever. Box Clever is run by a man called Bob Williams. Bob Williams is a fire chief, but also a, a first class referee. If you saw him, you'd know him. He's on all the fights. The patron is John Conti, and what they do is around places in Hertfordshire and the, the home counties generally, but in the rough parts of the home counties, where the kids are in exactly the boat you've just said, where they've got nowhere to go for two or three hours because mum and dad aren't back or, or mum by herself isn't back from work. Instead of being on the street, what Box Clever does is it opens the local boxing clubs early. All the coaches turn up and all the coaches come on in and they train the kids. They're not allowed to fight. They're not allowed to spar. They do the skills. They do the fitness they have a focus, they have an activity. Keeps them off the street. The antisocial levels in every area that they run this have gone down so low that Bob Williams has been called to the palace to be honoured or and not knighted, but some sort of honour for this charity. That's how effective it is. Wow. I mean, it's not just boxing. Do you work with, with them? I, do, I fundraise for them. I try and fundraise for them whenever I can because I think they're a fantastic charity. Well, well we should have, have, a, have a chat about that because obviously I'm a big boxing fan yeah. and... Uh, I, I want to encourage that because I think it's an important thing. Yeah, yeah no, and, and it, it really is. I mean, they, they need as much publicity as they can get. And then it's not just them. There are, there are others. There's a thing called Boxing Futures, which is quite similar in, in South London. And everywhere these things operate, they're effective. They're proven to be effective. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. And it's not just boxing. I mean, it, it's any activity. It's anything to do exactly what you said. Get them off. Get yeah. them off the streets that are not looking at the fella who's dealing drugs with his nice watch. Yeah. That's what they need. They need to look up to someone who is not in crime. With Box Clever, I take it if people go into that and then they decide, actually, I want to have a fight, I actually want to do this, yeah. then then do they have a programme which put, push them into that or do they then just find them a local boxing club and they can... It's all in boxing clubs. Right. They open the, bo they open the boxing clubs early and the coaches are all the boxing got coaches. Got it, got it. Okay, so, so they get it's, not, it's not a separate organisation. Nope. It actually just it, goes It is in. a separate organisation, but everyone's involved. Got it. So okay. what they'll then do is, that, that, say, that, say that they open at five, at half six, they close. At seven o'clock, the club opens. So if the kids want to actually compete, they just, they, they'll get permission from the parents and they wait. 
Amazing. And wait a bit long, and then obviously it goes from there. And as you know yourself, um, boxing for kids, you, as they get better, you take them to better clubs. Absolutely. Et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah, because I, I box with Les Stevens, um, Pinewood Star. Oh, and right. He actually fought John Conte before John Conte won a world title. Was that Pinewood out in by the studios? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, just, the, that's just about the best club there is these days. But what was actually quite funny, though, when I went, I didn't, because back then it was like a Travelers Boxing yeah. Club. And obviously I didn't know. Yeah. So I've just turned up and I've walked in and I've gone, I wanna I wanna I wanna join. And and the guy was a bit like, you know, I think you're in the wrong place, mate. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, still, it's still very it's still very much is. But junior yeah. boxing, certainly in West London, I always found yeah. West London more so than anywhere else. And Surrey. West London and Surrey, uh junior boxing is very, very traveller. Yeah. I mean it's very, and it and it still is. I grew up so I mean, I I knew all of the travellers from the local area. I mean, you and I met through a, a mutual friend of ours who was a yeah. traveller. That's how I know him, <laughs> going back that far. Wow. I mean, it's it, and I got to know all of the different travellers, which has actually kind of snowballed on into my career, into wow. my career as a criminal barrister. Those connections yeah. have actually meant a lot. So, you, so you're like the, the Ghostbusters of barristers. They're like, who are you going to call? <laughs> Tony Wyatt. <laughs> I've never thought that. But I've, I've never thought that, but we will. But we we'll have to find some way to incorporate that in. Right. That's actually a good idea for an advert. It is a really good idea. <laughs> well, I, I had so, I'm I, sure you don't need to advertise that. So, someone, I think it was the Daily Star, I got interviewed, I think it was the Daily Star, or it may, it may have been the Sun, but someone referred to me as as, as England's answer to better call Saul. <laughs> and they and they definitely thought it was a compliment. I read that and thought, oh, I Christ, that. all right, that's me, that. that's me finished. Fun. Better call Tone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's even better. <laughs> Excellent. So, so, so you obviously mentioned... Um, uh, you know, you, 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 your family were boxing. Yeah. You've got this Irish descent. Obviously, you're on a council estate. And and because your brother obviously obviously took a different path to you, um, that's that was the, what made you – was that the sort of maybe I should get involved in law? It was it was purely the, purely the inspiration. I never thought of anything. I used to love all the programmes. I used to love LA Law and Kavanaugh QC and Rumpole and all things like that. I used to love probably more than most kids do. But then, so which one would you be? Would you be Kavanaugh? Or would you be Rumpel? I'd like to think Rumpel. Right. Okay. <laughs> but if, if if any lawyers are watching this, right. they're going to laugh at that. Okay. Um, <laughs> but no, look, looking at looking back, what what happened? My brother got in trouble for a particular thing. There was a particular offence that he was in trouble for, and on this occasion, and I'm not going to suggest that on any other occasion he was innocent. I'm not going to suggest he was anything other than what he was. But on this particular occasion, he was definitely innocent. He hadn't done it. Uh, and there were three key pieces of evidence, one of which was goods. It was a jewellery robbery. And allegedly the jewels were found in my mum and dad's house. Not true. The one thing my brother would never have done is bring anything like that into his mum's house because his mum would have killed him. Right. And he was afraid of her. A lot, no a lot way. of people don't know that, but yeah, you don't want to upset an Irish <laughs> exactly. wife. <laughs> There's no way he would have done it. And he didn't do it. And actually my mum and dad were there when the police searched the place. They know nothing was found. Yeah. The other thing was a confession. He confessed to it. Uh, and then there was a third thing. I can't quite remember the third thing. The confession was he was 17 years old and they'd said to him, your mum's going to be really worried about you. Just tell us you did it and you'll, be, and you'll get home to her tonight. Wow. Just tell us, just, just admit it and you get home to her tonight. And so he said, you'll let me out? Yeah, I did it. And they released him for that reason. Oh, they, they, they charged him for, for, for that reason. That became evidence. And did they let him out? Of course they didn't let him out. So he was then defended by a fellow called Selwyn Shapiro who is recently retired. I got to know Selwyn later. And we went along to support my brother. And we went along to support him because rarely, or maybe uniquely, he was innocent this time. So normally my family, my mum and dad were, you know, you've made your bed, you lie in it. Not again. But on this, exactly. <laughs> but on this time, this time they knew that it was lies. So okay. they went to support him. And I went along. I was 14, I was 17, he was 17. So I would have been, God, I'd have been not much more than 12. Um, I always tell people I was 14, but doing the maths, you know, I was younger. Um, I went along and I watched it. And within 15 minutes of the very beginning of the case, I completely forgot my brother was in trouble. I forgot he was anything to do with it. I just couldn't take my eyes off the barrister because he was so good. And I came out afterwards and said to my mum, I said, mum, that's what I want to do. And then my mum did, <laughs> did the thing that, I, that she always regrets and always apologises for. She said... That's very good, son, but don't tell anyone because they'll laugh at you because <laughs> barristers don't come from us. And so for the next however many years, I loved the idea. I was obsessed with the idea of being a barrister, but I just always thought I couldn't be one Do because you, know you don't, you don't I... get to be one if you come from where we come from. I was joining the army. It was that, that I decided to join the army. 
And but but are you one of these people, Tony, that if someone says you can't do something, you go, I'm going to fucking do it. Because some people, when they're told they can't do things, they actually push back on it. Um, if, if I'm told I'm not good enough to do something, that will make... Someone once said to me, in a early, it's quite early on when I was boxing, um, I think I was about 13 years old, so around the same sort of time, I remember the coach saying, the kid turned up, and I was in, I was in an Uxbridge boxing club at first, which was a terrible club. Basically, it was, it was just, it was dying a death. I didn't know that. The coach was my uncle's old coach, and he'd been a decent coach, but he was old. And my uncle hadn't seen him in 20 years, and so he didn't realise that it had all gone. So anyway, I spent a year there before I realised, before I had my first fight, they got battered and realised this is no good. <laughs> and, uh, but during this time, there was this kid that turned up with a lot of natural ability. And I didn't have a huge amount of natural ability. I was really strong. I could hit really hard. And I had a head like an anvil. And those three things were, were the basis of my entire boxing career. I was never particularly talented. I could just hit really, uh, just all natural things. You know, things that it's okay to say, because it's not boasting, because you're just born that way. Um, I didn't achieve any of them. I just, we genetically could hit hard and take a punch. And I was very strong. And there's this kid turned up who had all the natural talent. And he'd, he joined about six months after me. And I remember the coach saying to me, no, I wouldn't put you in a ring with him. No, no, you can't get in a ring. He's, he's got too much for you. And yeah, that turned, I mean, it became an obsession. I became absolutely obsessed with hurting him. And it was, I mean, because when you're, when you're a kid, you don't really equate the consequences of, I'm going to bash this bloke up, so actually I'm going to hurt this poor kid. But the thing, but, you can do it legally in the boxing ring. Exactly. <laughs> but no, and so, and so I spent I spent months. That that made, I was doing twice the amount of press-ups that I was doing before that. I was doing twice the length of runs for exactly what you said. Because he said, I wouldn't put you in the ring with him. I was like, yeah. I love this. Let's the, bo see. the boxing barrister. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And, and, yeah, and, and it worked. <laughs> it worked out quite well. But the one person that I, that I never did that with was my mum. If she said you couldn't do it, you couldn't do it. And I think the thing that saved me with, with the bar... Two things. Well, the, mainly, I tried to join the Paris when I was 16. And I went and did all my tests, did really well. I was as fit as a fiddle. I was bright. Um, they said, well, you, you're not enlisting. You, I, I went to try to enlist. They said, no, you're not enlisting. You've got to be an officer. If you, you know, With the marks you've got, this is officer marks, blah, blah, blah. Oh, so, so growing up as a kid, you was, you was bright at school. You had a, yeah, you I was, I was always bright, but, oh. but I didn't do much. I was just naturally bright. I didn't really, I didn't study much. I'd, I... Gen honestly, without perpetuating a stereotype, at least once a week I'd be off tarmacking with my dad rather than being at school. You'd know, be off laying a laying a driveway or up on a roof at least once. So I'd be missing at least a day a week. You'd be missing at least another day a week just playing football in the... Did your parents, um, <clears throat> did they encourage you to study and, and no, do well? There was there was no expectation for any of us to be anything other than, right. than, than builders. Everyone in the family was a builder. I wonder whether that was... Because how old are you, Tony? Uh, 45. Yeah, because I'm 52. I said, they said 53, but that's this week. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but no, but um, I'm, 50, I'm 52. And, and when I grew up, my parents were the same. And I wonder whether it was something around that time where... It's a working where class If thing. you're on a, on, a, on a council estate, the parents don't realise the value of education. They go, well, you're not going to uni. I never went to uni. So we're in this. And I think that's one of the problems yeah. of the working classes. Yeah. That they all sort of basically tell each other that they can't do this and they can't do that. And they kind of hold themselves down. Well, I Whereas think, you I think can't that's do still anything. the case. I think that's still the case. The only difference is everyone now expects to go to university. But in most cases, I think university is almost like that's your, that's your three-year jolly before life starts. Yeah. But they expect life to still be the same. So I think the same the same barriers are there. It's just that it now includes a little three year trip to university. What, what was quite shocking? I've got uh, an older son who's twenty now, and when we was he was doing his A levels, um, we was at the school, and and the the, the head teacher said, you know, uh, unless he wants to be a lawyer, an accountant, a doctor, or an engineer, there's no point in going to university. That's <laughs> and I was and I was like and I was like. Shouldn't you be selling the university yeah. thing, right? And he was like, no, no, no. He said, he said the issues the kids have got now is the jobs they're going to be doing haven't even been invented yet. Yeah. And when you hear that, you think, well, how can you prepare? For and I did think, well, the only way you can prepare for it is is working hard yeah. and, and applying yourself Create to whatever comes. Ethic. Understand what a work ethic is. Yeah. Understand how to work. Understand. I, I, you know, I, I had a work ethic because I was getting up and tarmacking and I was getting up at 14 years old, I was on a roof. At 14 years old, I was pushing a tarmac barrow and things like that. 
And that was every day during the holidays, but it was also some of the school days. I mean, don't get me wrong. I should say my mum and dad were incredibly supportive. Mm. The moment they realised that I, the moment they realised I was academically bright to, to the extent that I was, um, which was uh, which which was unusual for us. We weren't an academic family. I was the first person in the family so, to so, do. So you was the white sheep of the family. I was the white. <laughs> I was the white sheep of the Wyatt family. <laughs> But I was the first to do a degree. Well, I was the first to do my GCSEs. Wow. My two older brothers were both expelled by then. And I did my GCSEs and then I obviously A-levels and then uh, and, th and then degree. And all of that was a first for our family. What degree did you do? Law. Oh, so you so literally from that young age, yeah. you knew you were going to be a lawyer? No, no, I didn't. Honestly, I, I knew I wanted to be one. Got it. But I was convinced that that was some special thing. You might as well have said you want to be a pope. But you had a go, basically. Well, I, I did in the end. I intended to join the army. As I said, I tried to join when I was 16. They said, I oh, know you've got to go do the officer thing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. My mum wouldn't sign me off. She said, not, not in a million years. You're not joining the army. So I thought, well, I'll just sign myself when I'm 18. You know, then, then you can't stop me. I needed to kill some time. So I killed time by doing my A-levels. And for the and that was the first time that I did a bit of work. I actually, <laughs> I actually not a lot. I'm not going to pretend that I was that studious, but I, you know, I focused myself a bit more. And I got A's on everything, and I, you know, I did, everything just it all went as well as it could possibly go. At which point, I came back. I'd not applied, I hadn't applied to university because I was still going to the army. I came back, and my mum said, um, said, because she knew what my plan was. She then said, maybe you might want to try the barrister thing. So I then went and got some prospectuses. I had, I think, twenty four or forty eight hours to apply, and a thing called clearing it was then, because I hadn't actually applied. So I'd done no research. I'd gone to no universities. I'd looked at nothing. And I had to find one to go to. So I found I found the one, my two criteria in the end was only one of them advertised a boxing club. And that was Dundee, where I ended up going. And then I checked out how many girls there were to blokes. And there were two girls to every man. And so I just done thought, deal. done, I'll be there. <laughs> and, and that was me. I, I chose the furthest university you can go to in the country to study English law Um purely on the basis of a boxing club, which when I got there turned out to be shit. <laughs> and a, um, and uh, the, the fact there were lots and lots of women there. Wow. Which turned out better. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, so it was like, you know, you, 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 you thought you was, <clears throat> but there are some good boxing clubs uh, up in the North. I mean, did you have to find another one or did you just make do with that? I took it. I took it over. Okay. I, um, I, within six months, I was the coach and captain of the club. Within two years, we were the British champion team. Wow. Uh, but I just turned them round and, uh, I think we won all. We won every British title we, 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 that we went in for, every Scottish title we went in for, et cetera, et cetera. And then I left and then it all went to shit again. Because <laughs> it's quite, because I, I know the Scottish people are, are, are quite a proud group of people. And, and uh, did, did they enjoy sort of, you know, <laughs> a company going up there telling them how, how old the man's up? L luckily, there, there weren't a huge amount of Scottish people in Dundee University. It's mainly Northern Irish. Weirdly, I didn't know the, that. The, the, the no. largest population per head of population, the largest, the largest amount of Northern Irish people anywhere in the world outside of Northern Ireland is Dundee wow. because of the university. But no, they were fine because I knew what I was doing. If I just turned up and it was some Larry Londoner who, who was just talking absolute <laughs> shit, then it wouldn't have gone quite so well. But I was able to basically say, look, this, let's go back to basics and just do it this way. And then we got in the chap who used to coach us, who, who was coaching before I got there, had left. And his brother came along and helped us out as well. And his brother was a fellow called Dick McTaggart. Now, Dick McTaggart is the single greatest amateur boxer from this country. Wow. 627 fights, 612 wins. Uh, gold medal in 1956. Val Barkov Trophy, 1956. I mean, yeah. it's got a record like no one else has got. When you said his name then, I thought he was on about the guy, you know, Taggart. Taggart, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a different one. Go, right. just, just, just to put in perspective, just in case I sound self-aggrandizing, to put in perspective my own ability as a boxer, Dick must have been 68 or 69. It's got to be mid-60s, let's say. I was 18. I was as fit as a fiddle. We sparred and I couldn't touch him. I wow. could not lay a hand wow. on him. It was like fight, it was like sparring water. He well, was just here, there, and everywhere. Well, I think when them, a lot of them uh, old pros or all the all the guys that were like on a massive high amateur level, even I mean, you never really sort of even though you might not be out to train like you used to, you, you can still hold your hands up and you still get out of the way. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, the movement is still there. Do you still, do you still train now, Tony? Do you still do a bit? Not as much as I'd like to. I haven't for a few months. I'm. 
we've basically we've been moving. We've been moving house, and it, it was it was a lot. I won't bore you, but a load of rigmarole with the whole thing. It turns into a six month process. So I've had six months of stagnation. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm trying to build a gym, a little boxing gym at the back of my garden now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, until that's up, I'm going to have to just go to the go to the normal gym with weights and stuff like that. Yeah. But I I never feel like I'm training if I'm just lifting weights. I never feel because it's not the thing that I did. Yeah. And, you know, I need a bag. I need a bag. I need a speedboard. I need a ring. Yeah. And and when you got your degree, <clears throat> um, what happened after that? Did, did you literally come back to, to Norfolk and then thought, what should I do now? Or, or did you ever think in the back of your mind, did the army just completely go out of your mind then? Yeah, but but by the time I went to Dundee, I was, going, I was going there to be a barrister. So I did a degree up there. It takes four years in Scotland rather than three. Did the four years up there. Came straight down to Bar School, um, which is basically where you do your, you, know, you, do, you just, Bar School is a it's total. Not ballet, right? it's not <laughs> bar School <laughs> is a total and utter waste of time. Simple as that. I don't, it's a way of taking money from you. You learn in pupillage. Pupillage is what you do the year after Bar School, where you're, it's, an, it's, a, it's a fancy word for apprenticeship. You follow a barrister around for six months, you do all their donkey work, you do whatever they tell you. And then after six months, you get on your feet in the magistrate's court and you start learning. That's how it used to be. Bar school before that was is a stage you've got to go to because it's part of the process. I gave up bar school as a full time thing after three months, um, and I went. I, be, I became a hod carrier. I just went off to pay, to pay off to earn the money to pay off the money because bar school costs twelve ten grand. So I went. I went and earned the money to pay off the loan that I got for bar school because they weren't teaching me anything. I just said I'll learn from the books, and I just did that. When the exams came, there were multiple choice exams. I passed them easy. Because it, you can just learn it from the books. It's a complete waste of time. Pupillage, total different story. I learned everything that I needed to know in pupillage. That's where you that's where you really learn. And I was very lucky with pupillage because coming from where I came from, I still always had the little chip on my shoulder. That whole, I'm not made to be a barrister. I'm not from the right place. So I then went to Dundee, which, you know, it was a great university. I had a wonderful time. It's a very good university. It's not Oxford. It's not Cambridge. It's not got that reputation. Right. So I came down thinking, I'm not going to apply to, you only get 12 applications. You get to apply to 12 chambers for your pupillage. I thought, I'm not going to apply to the good ones because they're not going to take me. Why would they take me? A comprehensive school, council estate, Dundee University. They're not going to, they're going to go Oxbridge. So back then, all of the chambers were based entirely upon their, the, the, the names of their address. So you'd have um, two Bedford Row, you'd have 18 Red Line Court, you'd have, uh, as was, three Hare Court back then was, was they were the equivalent of Man United back then. They were the absolute, you know, no one comes close. So I'm not applying to any of those guys. I go through the ones that I'm going to, that I will apply to, the ones that I've just not really heard much about, one of which was two Bedford Row. So I applied to two Bedford Row. Go along, you know, I'm relaxed, who are you? Not interested in you. Uh, go along, very very uh, relaxed interview. They asked me to come back for another interview, go back again, no stress, relaxed interview. They asked me to go back again, go and do a third thing. And then they offered me a pupillage. And so at this point, I decided I better do some homework and check them out. Doing the homework and check them out, I discovered they were three-hair court. They just moved buildings. Wow. And they, they changed their name to Two Bedford Row and I hadn't followed through on who they might be. <laughs> so I lucked into Man United. Wow. I mean, my, my career began, I was 22 years, 22 years old in the number one criminal chambers in the country. And that's where I stayed for 12 years. They trained me for that year. At the end of that year, they offered me membership, tenancy. Who did you work under? Who was the barrister that you was? Barrister I worked under was a man called Craig Rush. Um, I was, again, I was extremely lucky to get Craig for two reasons. Number one, our minds work in a very, very, very similar way. We're, we're not typical barristers. We're sort of much more instinctive and much more sort of three-dimensional in the way you'd look at something. There are cases that would suit the likes of me or him down to the ground, and there are cases where the likes of me and him would be the last person you want. So I'm not saying that makes you better, just saying it makes you more suited to certain cases. And there are other barristers who are much more methodical and much more... Um, absolutely down the line of the way it's done. And again, there are cases that they would be far better at than we would, while some that they wouldn't be so great at. The, the, the other reason that I was quite lucky with Craig is that he became my, probably my closest friend and still is. I, he was my best man. I was his best man. You know, we, we just gelled. And 
I had a very, very, very big run of luck, a long run of luck at that point in my life. And, and obviously now you've been doing it for such a long period of time and you obviously know your strengths. If somebody approached you and said, you know, I need you to defend me for whatever, whatever if you looked at it, um, and, and, and this may be true for Barrister, for it may not be, do, do you tend to look at cases and say, this isn't right for me, Yes, but you should try this guy or this woman? There's, a trial, you you there's a trial going on at the moment at the time we're recording this as opposed to when it's out. The trial going on at the moment with a, a sexual event involving a very wealthy Russian man um, willing to pay an awful lot of money to be defended. And he came to me and I said, you don't want me. I'm not the man for this. You want X. And we sent him to a, uh, a king's council, um, a female king's council, very another very close friend of mine who will inevitably doing a, be doing a much better job for him than I ever could have done. You've got to know your strengths. Yeah. You know, no, no, there is no such thing as, as a barrister for all cases. Right. So what do you, as a barrister, what's your special, what do you specialise in? I specialise in, I would guess, serious organised crime. Anything that's organised crime, really. Uh, violence and murders. Violence, I'm, I'm pretty good with violence because I understand it. From, yeah. from from my past, from boxing and things in a way that people don't necessarily. Uh, murder and things like that kind of just follow on from that. They are just violence with a much more extreme outcome. But other than that, probably organised crime. Yeah. I do a bit of fraud, right. uh, but mainly it's um, it's drugs, uh, you know, all the stuff that you would imagine that follows with you know, people that get described as gangsters, I guess. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you've obviously come into some interesting characters. Over the past, yeah. was it 30 years? Would you say? 20, 20. 22 now, I think. 22 years, yeah. wow, wow. So, um, yeah, what would you say was the, what was it, what's what's the, what's one of your biggest drug cases? Um, in terms of the biggest drug cases, uh, oh, there's so many of them. <laughs> I, I should have thought this through. I mean, just just recently, we, uh, we recently, I went to court quite recently on one that would have been the big, if it was truthful at all would have been the biggest drug case in history. Um, I was in the magistrate's court and we were trying to get bail for our client. And the prosecutor says, oh, no, no, it's just 62 tonnes of cocaine. And I just said, I said sorry, what? And it's 62 tonnes. I said, well, it's not written down anywhere, is it? Oh, no, no. But I, I, I said, no, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. Uh, why am I wrong? I said, because calculating it, that would be one and a half years of the national supply of cocaine. And it would be, and just off the top of my head, wholesale, that's 2.4 billion pounds worth of cocaine. It's a lot of cocaine. Do you really think someone's going to do that in one importation on a ship that might go down? I said, it's just ridiculous. You've made a mistake. Go and sort, go and check it out. So in the end, she's went out to check it, went out to the officer and the officer confirmed, yeah, it was that. It's exactly what it was. Comes back in, tells the magistrates court that they can't have bail on a case this size. This is ridiculous. So I applied for bail on the basis everything you've just been told is wrong. And I said, and whether you're being told it intentionally, whether you're being intentionally misled or whether it's just incompetence, doesn't matter. There's no way that it is that size. As it turned out, it was an importation that had been hidden under a ton of fish. So there was a ton involved, but a ton wasn't cocaine. It was a ton of fish. Doesn't that make the drug smell funny? Uh, I think that's the point. <laughs> I think that's so not, you know, you've got, you've got the, that puts the dogs off, doesn't it? It puts off any sort of, any scent based um, apprehension of it. So, Judged, if, if it's about a ton, if it's a ton of fish, then it's probably going to be about 200 kilos. So it's still wow. substantial, but I mean, that, and that's just, I mean, that's typical. That's kind of day, for me, that's pretty much day to day. It'll wow. be in, in the 200, 300, 400 kilos. Because, because, because I don't know if you've ever come across a character called Andrew Pritchard. Yes. Um, and uh, he's, he's been on the podcast yeah. and uh, uh, we haven't put his episode out yet. Yeah. He was talking and he was saying that the way that these, import export things work yeah. is normally people are paid off um so i mean it, it, you know looking at cases now i mean i think his one was maybe 20 years ago yeah. um how's it changed i mean it, it, is is are people still getting paid off or or is it just the lack of the draw people just come up with these ingenious ways i mean he told me one story about a submarine yeah. and all sorts of stuff I mean, it's, yeah. do you know what it's it's purely the luck of the draw there are I'm sure that there are different ingenious ways that people do it. Generally, they just take the risk. Generally, it's in the back of a lorry. It's on a boat. It's in a plane. It's a, generally any one of these things. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, they will understand that there is a certain amount of people that are just going to get nabbed. And that's why couriers 
are, that's why cour couriers are always generally quite vulnerable people, quite desperate people. The, co the people who are behind this stuff don't get their hands dirty. If you go before a court, uh, I was in court last week for a chap who was, he'd been involved in, in one conspiracy and then a year later, another conspiracy, two completely separate conspiracies. And then the second, in the first conspiracy, he looked like a bit of a player. And then the second conspiracy, he was driving the drugs around and, and custody, custody, uh, the custodian of the drugs in the house. And by looking at the, at, the, at the two, I was able to sit down with him and say, look, no offense, but I've looked at the language you're using. You're using street language rather than wholesale language. So clearly you were new to this. So when you were dealing in kilos and 10 kilos and 15, you were new to this at that point. This wasn't what you were doing. You've obviously got hold of an Encro phone and you've, you've got your way in there, but this was new to you. You were, you, and he said, yeah, that's, that's right. I said, and also don't be offended, but you were clearly shit at it because <laughs> within two months you owed 180 grand. He said, yeah, I did. I said, right. So am I right in thinking then that the reason you were a dog's body 18 months later is you're paying off the debt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all it's all luck. It's, you know, some people know what they're doing. Some people don't know what they're doing. Whether or not you get caught with this stuff is luck because ultimately this guy, despite being terrible at what he was doing and, and the most incompetent drug wholesaler in the world, he still wouldn't have been caught if the girl that he had dropped off some money to, or some drugs to, pardon me, she dropped money to him, if the girl he had dropped off some drugs to hadn't then driven into uh, into a into a petrol station and got into an argument, which is which is how she was caught. Wow. And then the and then they went to their phones and they've backed their phones and they found him. They went to his house, going to his house. They found fifteen kilos in the house, and it and, and an entire drug ring collapsed because of that petrol station incident. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy, isn't it? And I, do you find that that's that's that that tends to be how these people get caught? It, it's normally through something silly or someone yeah, doing something. Used silly. to be. At the moment, it's encros. Everyone's getting caught from Encro. I'm sure you, you know you know what Encro is. I'm sure so, you've done that on here. So we had uh, John Cooper, yep. um, on, and uh, he, he was he, he touched on it. He didn't really go into any massive detail on it, but um, I remember hearing about these phones. Yeah, um, probably two years ago. Yeah, I know they've been around forever, but um, and someone was going, oh, um, you know, they're really good. They're really secure. It wasn't just criminals that had them. It was like people that wanted yep. to keep their things private. There Wealthy was, people, yeah, footballers, celebrities, yeah. all them sort of all people. the people who were getting hacked. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think that the hacking stuff meant that if anybody was worried about being hacked or yeah. whatever, and I was like, well, I don't, I don't need, I don't need one of them phones. You know what I mean? It wasn't for me. But um, I remember hearing about, it, and I remember at the time when someone was saying to me, um, "It's really good, you know, it's really secure, and all this." And I was thinking, nothing really is ever secure, right? Yeah. And 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 what made me laugh. And it was literally, I don't know if this was done intentionally or whether it was done as, as a practical joke, but my understanding was that when the UK and pretty much the world locked down in COVID, on the 1st of April, which is obviously April Fool's yeah. Day, lots of people were getting nicked for these yeah. phones. Yeah. And, and and apparently, again, I, I don't really know a lot about it, but people were literally sending messages to people saying, I want you to kill that person. I want yep. you to sell them drugs. Pick that money up. They treated so these phones as if they were absolutely unbreakable. Nothing's unbreakable. The most unbreakable thing, now I know this because I've been involved with so many of these cases since 2020. The most unbreakable thing is WhatsApp and Gmail. WhatsApp and Gmail. The reason being, and it, and it makes sense when you think about it, WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. Gmail is owned by Google. Those companies are so inconceivably rich that they can throw resources at encryption in a way that Encro, for example, who had, I think, about 2,000, 6,000 users, whatever it was, right. certainly in the thousands and below 10,000. Um, and all right, they're getting paid a good bit of money by these people, but that's not even comparable. It's like Angola against the United States. There's just no comparison to, their, to, to, to what they've got. So actually, the safest forms of encrypted communication are Gmail and WhatsApp. WhatsApp is flawed, of course, because if you get someone's phone, it's all on there. Uh, whereas Encro just got rid of it all. But yeah. in terms of in terms of actual transmission encryption, it's WhatsApp. So, so how G did... Gmail less so for the simple reason that you can get a warrant to Google and make them give you their in information. The reason they can do that is because they use their they use the emailing the email system for data mining and for directing ads. 
And the fact they do that reveals that they have a backdoor in. Right. So therefore, you can get a warrant on them. You don't get that on WhatsApp, so there's no proof of a backdoor in. So you could serve a warrant and WhatsApp can just say... Oh, I thought that was all... all uh, I thought WhatsApp was breakable. I didn't realise that. It's, it, it's, it's breakable in this, to the extent that it's on your phone. So you can get into the phone and it's not deleted. Yeah. Um, so all these people were buying these things, these Encro things... Which would, be, I mean, it's not what a waste they, of money. It, they should have just got what's happened. Well, that, 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 that's the point, though, is they were so they were they were so confident in what was really internationally the equivalent of something knocked up by a bloke in a shed, as opposed to Google, where it was Cause, NASA. Because you know? some somebody said to me, uh, and again, it's it's a conspiracy theory, but someone said, "What a great way to catch criminals." Set up a company, sell the phone. It's unbreakable, it's unhackable. Let them get away with it for a couple of years and then nick them all. I believe very strong. I believe very, very strongly, very strongly, and it's just my opinion, but it's based upon quite a lot of cases. Yeah. I believe very strongly that every encrypted phone that is because the Encro wasn't the first system. Encro was followed by Sky, another not Sky TV, but a thing called Sky. Right, okay. It was predated by another system. They go back years. Um Encro just happened to be the one at the time that would that had taken right. all the that, that, that was the flavour of the month. I believe we've always been able to break them. I believe that our domestic services, MI5 security services, have been able to break them all along. Okay. The reason that the Encro prosecutions happened was because the French broke them. And when the French broke them, they it came to light. And what had happened came to light, and Encro sent out a message saying, everyone, lose your phones, we've been breached. Oh, 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 and I think, French, I think French. that's what happened. <laughs> I think we, I, I genuinely believe that maybe not the Encro system, but every, I think all the other systems, we've been reading them for years. And the reason I think oh. that is because there are st there's just too many cases that you say, how did they turn up there? There's either a grass, right. which makes no sense in certain cases, when there's so few people involved in a certain transaction, and they're all nicked and they're all convicted. Where's the grass? So I suppose it's better, really. <clears throat> it's better to breach it and not to, tell you, because then you just catch you in the act. Right, got it. They're far. I always felt there were far too many being, people being caught in the act for it to be luck. But if the French um, broke it, hacked it, whatever they did, someone said they somehow put a patch up in the cloud or whatever. They and effectively all your they phones. effectively downloaded an app. So imagine it's an imagine this is an iPhone, not an Encro phone. When you download it, when, when, you, when you press a button, your app comes on, you, you go to the app store, you pick an app. They basically force the app onto everyone's phone. Got it. And so if your phone was on when they pressed that button, it got it. They did it about four times. Oh, so, so it wasn't so a patch. It was actually, they just was literally app. sent an app out to everybody. They, they essentially sent an app out to all the phones. And did not, it come up on the phones then? Or not? No, no, no. It, oh, it, so it was always... It, it was, it was, it, I, use, I say an app, it's not an app you would use. It's like an app they could use. Got it. There was no appearance on the phone anywhere, but it was it was the same technology really in, in terms of transmission, we so believe, it's like bomb, as an app. <laughs> very, no, very much so. I actually cross-examined the, um, cross the, the British expert, a man called Luke Shrimpton, who is the NCA expert. I did a big drugs importation based on Encro um, about six months ago. Uh, a chap who was accused of bringing in, I think, 400 kilos. And it was all based upon, the whole case was based upon messages in an Encro that he admitted was his. Because his, our defence was, I'm a money launderer. I have an Encro because I launder money. I, I am a criminal. But those messages that have appeared on here, they weren't from me. I've got no idea how they're on here. And we, you know, we, we ran that trial. And I cross-examined the chap in the course of the trial, Luke Trimpton, who's the expert on it. And it was like James Bond. It was. It was, it was I mean, I. I we'll so come could on. they literally physically put the messages on your phone? No, no, no. They, they, oh. they, they can't. They can't do that. They can't. There was no transmission from them. We still don't fully understand it. I mean, because we're not allowed to know for national insurance. For national insurance, national security reasons. The so um, I just reduced that, haven't I? <laughs> exactly. I've, got, I've got it in my head. <laughs> this is why. So trying to work out next next year's tax bill. Um, for, for national security reasons, the French refused to let us know what te what the technology was. So for the last three or four years, there's been constant arguments back and forth. For some reason, in this country, you are not allowed to rely upon in evidence material that was collected in transmission. So if it's been intercepted as a, as a live transmission, can't be evidential. Whereas if it was taken from the phone's memory, so if, even if it's landed for five seconds or even a second, if it's taken from the phone's memory, it's not live transmission, it's a storage, and that's admissible. Don't ask why, because I don't know okay, why. No, none none, none of us yeah. know why. Wow. But it's a massive distinction. And that distinction 
has caused four years of litigation. Because the, the, the last four years has simply been people saying, you don't know how this was done. We believe it had to be done live. And if it was live, you shouldn't be allowed to rely on it. Now, the Court of Appeal at every single stage, every single, not the criminal justice system, at every stage so far from the Crown Court up has rejected that, basically saying, no, no, you need to prove it's live. And until we know it's live, it's admissible. So it's just round and round in circles. Yeah, so, and so there are a number of experts. Like Professor Anderson is the world authority on this. He's the world authority on a system, Professor Anderson, that he's never seen because he's never been allowed to have one of the encrophones. Wow. He's never had an infected encrophone to examine. And the NCA, National Crime Agency, are refusing to allow anyone to have the encrophones. It's a, it's a very, very, very messy situation that is it's all a little bit murky with a lot of sort of security service, MI5, James Bondy right. stuff going do you on. Think, do you think it's um, because it's a national security thing rather than it just being a crime thing? You think... It, Obviously, if, if if they start disclosing things like that, then it obviously gives people ways of working around. I think that rightly, we should be told. If it was a live transmission, it's their law. We didn't create the law. Parliament created the law. And if Parliament's created that law, the criminal the, the, the criminal investigators or whoever who work ultimately for the Crown, so ultimately for Parliament, should have to abide by that law and they should therefore have to tell us. But that's just my... That's my pure legalistic belief from a public policy point of view i totally get it how do you defend how do you defend against that when someone says there's the message from your client saying kill that person or sell those drugs or put that money in here or whatever i, I mean because it must be very I, difficult I, to... i've 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 only do you fought, defend or prosecute or i defend i'll defend, I defend. Right. i've only fought one of those to trial because very few of them are going to trial ordinarily it's you look at it and, and you just work out a basis of plea that will limit your culpability and bring your sentence down. And that becomes the exercise normally, because you are right, it is very difficult. Um, the case I told you about earlier with the 400 kilograms of, in, the 400 kilogram importation, where he said, yes, that is my phone. Yes, I am a money launderer, but those messages weren't, shouldn't be on that phone. We won that case. And we won that case on exactly, on exactly that basis. I actually used, it's now, the whole post office thing is now the only thing in the news, <laughs> but which is, shows the power of television because we've all known about this case for years. And it's been going on for three or four years, but now suddenly everyone knows about it. Well, I actually used that case in this trial by saying to the jury, I got the, the Luke Shrimpton chap, the expert. He was saying, well, no, no, it's, it's definitely attributed correctly. Those messages are attributed there. So I ran through all the stages that where it could have gone wrong. I said, well, because you weren't part of this, you don't know about that, because the French won't tell them. You don't know this, you don't know this. You don't know how it was stored, you don't know how it was sent, you don't know how it was transmitted, you don't know how it was collated, you don't know how the attribution then was then... I said, you don't know any of those things, but you're confident, aren't you, that you're right, that the attribution's fine, because you've got an algorithm, and you've developed an algorithm, and you run it all through the algorithm, and the algorithm's fine, okay? And if the, if the algorithm's wrong, it would be wrong. He said, but it's not wrong. But if it was wrong, it would be wrong, well, yeah. So then I said to the jury, well, he's very confident in his system, but so were Fujitsu in the Horizon system with the post office. And we know that uh, I think 770-odd postmasters have been wrongly convicted, et cetera, et cetera, because that was the last time that we said, you can trust the computer. Computer says yes. And they're acquitted on the basis, on, 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 on what had to only be that basis. And if it, if it had gone the other way, where he'd have actually got... Um if you've been you convicted, be, what would what would uh, what would what what would he have got for after like trial? That? Around twenty eight years. Wow, something along those. Uh, that that was my estimate based upon the the various facts of the case. Was he was looking at between twenty seven and thirty years? Over your years of defending um, these the sort of criminals, what was the what would you say is probably the 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 the, the biggest or the or the most? I mean, obviously you've talked about the drug side, but on the other side, what's been the most serious sort of Crime. Most serious crimes are always murder. Um, well, I say you say that. I say that you instinctively say that because it's a life sentence. Whatever happens, if you're guilty, it's a life sentence. Um, I have to be honest. The drugs these days, you're getting you're getting murder sentences for drugs. They're not life sentences, so you don't have the life license when you come out. But you're getting sentences. That, what does that actually mean? The life license, just for viewers and listeners. Life license. If you get a life sentence, then you are, you get given a minimum term. So let's say you get fifty, you get life minimum fifteen. 
after 15 years, you can apply to come out. You get, you can apply for parole. Very rarely do you get it first time. Um, second, third, fourth, could be 20th time, you know, but you can keep, you can keep applying to come out. Ultimately, however, once you're out, you're on a license. That license has, gives some restrictions to the way you can live your life. It can give some restrictions on where you can live. You've got to keep people informed of certain things. But most importantly, if you're arrested for an offence, literally arrested, you get dragged back into prison. Right. Uh, you're, 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 you're pulled straight back into your licence. And if that thing is then dropped, you still have to go through the process again to come out. Wow. So even, so let's say you get nicked for a fight in a pub and then it turns out that you were defending yourself. All fine, all dropped. You could then still be in prison for another few years. Wait as you apply to come out again. Do they still accept them get out of jail free cars from Monopoly? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure if, my, if what my brother told me was right, they banned Monopoly in most jails because everyone kept doing that. They were getting buzzed at a, a two or three. Go. Go. <laughs> Got this. Go. My brother's certainly done it a few times. Right. But, um, but yeah, so, 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 so drugs cases these days, you don't get, unless you get a life sentence, <laughs> which you don't. Um, is it mainly, would you say cocaine is the, the big thing? Oh, by far, or, by far. Okay. Cocaine use in this country is off the scale. I mean, just off the scale. It's, it's completely normalised. I'm not a big believer in the continued criminalisation of drugs. It's failed. We had a war on drugs. We lost it. It would cost me, personally, most of my income if they were to legalise drugs. But from a society societal level, they should legalise drugs. Because if you look at, before 1956, you get you got your heroin on the NHS. People would be so given the, and I'm not suggesting go back to exactly that. Well, they used to have that. Coke in, in Coca-Cola, didn't they? Yeah, did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but before 56 was with the Misuse of Drugs Act. Heroin was available on the NHS. They, so people were getting it. It was quite pure. There were no irregularities. Uh, there were no um, impurities that were killing people. Um, they were getting a certain amount so they couldn't overdose. They were going to work. And at night, they were coming home and they were knocked out. And then the next day, they're back at work and then home and they're knocked out. No old ladies were being robbed in order to fund it. Mm. Just things like that. It's, it's, it's not so much the drug bit itself. It is the drugs itself because if it's regulated, then it's going to be cleaner and there'll be far fewer drug deaths. But it's also really the consequences of drugs, the, what people are doing to get the money to buy it. If it was regulated, there, nothing, nothing is 100%. Nothing, you can't say anything is the perfect solution. But let's say you've got cancer and you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, we could do this treatment, but it's only got a 20% success rate, so let's not bother. You, know, you don't do that, do you? You say, well, let's don't come, can we crack on let's with that? 20%, yeah. Whereas whereas you see people in the news, so, well, that doesn't always work. There were there were murders before there was this. Yeah, because some of them will always happen, but there were fewer. <laughs> it did work. Yeah. It just didn't work completely. But not working completely isn't a reason not to do it. So I'm um, so I'm a believer in that. I think. Uh, whereas I feel that our government is going the other way. Politicians generally, not just the Tory government, the, the politicians across the world are going in the other direction. So instead of looking at maybe maybe we need to rethink the war on drugs, they're just increasing sentences. And now you don't really get any sentences that come close to drug sentences apart from murder. So the most serious thing still, because of the level upon which we operate with the kind of cases we do, uh, it's probably dr drugs and murder are the two things that are the most serious stuff we do. And, and obviously you've talked about uh, the drugs and, and how s something silly like the girl having a row in a petrol station can lead to yeah. obviously the whole thing being brought down. With, with murders, I mean, I know now with forensics, with the number plate recognition, the cameras, you know, everything sort of moved on so much. I mean, it, it, I take it if you, to get away with a murder now, you, I mean, it's it's probably near, near, near or impossible. I think there's there's two ways of looking Not at it. Not that I'm asking you to <laughs> tell me how to do it. <laughs> there's, 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 there's two answers to that. There is uh, getting away with murder once, once you're, once, assuming you're guilty, obviously everything was, was the assumption of guilt. Um, getting away with murder once you're on trial uh, there aren't a huge amount of trials that go the defence way, murder trials. There aren't a huge amount of them. It's the, the, the conviction rate for murder is much higher than for everything else. But there's a reason for that. Everyone fights them because you get in life anyway. Whatever happens, you get in life. So cases in which someone would normally fight, would normally say, get me a deal. What's the deal? Unless you can get manslaughter, there's no deal. So there's a lot, a lot more unwinnable murder trials get Just fought. So, you know, everyone understands this. Somebody 
gets arrested and charged with a murder. Yeah. And they, when, when you know, the CPS say, like, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Yeah. Do, do you then have, a, as a barrister, or is it the lawyer that has the conversation and says, will you drop this to manslaughter? Or, or do you never have that conversation? Yeah, you, I know you do have that conversation. Right. That, that normally begins, it can begin with the solicitors and the CPS. Um, I would say it probably begin, it probably happens more often between the barristers. Uh, because ordinarily, once we're involved, is when the stuff starts coming in that you can actually work with. Got it. Whereas the solicitors are at a much earlier stage than us. Yeah. And they're not necessarily far enough into the process to be able to say, well, look at this, this, and this. They demonstrate the following because they've got far less material. By the time we're brought in, we're there and we've got most of the stuff and you can and you can look at it in, in the round and and then you have a chat to the prosecutor and say, well, the sensible resolution is this. But it's not that common in murder. It's not that common in murder that they would say, no, no, it's a manslaughter. A manslaughter, is, without going to the details of it, because I don't want to give a law lecture, a manslaughter is a very particular thing. It's not quite as wide a thing as, as the general public think. Um, it's very specific circumstances that can be manslaughter, and murder is much wider. If you if you kill someone when you only intended to hurt them, to very seriously hurt them, that's murder. So if they accidentally die because you've smacked because you've punched them in the chin, intending to break their jaw, that's murder. Whereas people would think, well, isn't that manslaughter? No, it's not. It's manslaughter if if you've done something that that wasn't intending to hurt them and they've died anyway. So so so, so if if somebody attacked you and you hit them and they fell over and they were on the concrete and died, then that would be that would be manslaughter. Got it. That'd be manslaughter. What, Whereas what, if you attack them, murder. And what's the, what's the... What's well, in fact, it would only be manslaughter if, you, if you've gone, to, so I should, it goes even further. That's why I'm trying to avoid the law lecture. But actually that circum, that example, there are circumstances in which that's nothing. Because there are circumstances in which if what you did was reasonable, well, at not, that stage, at that stage, it's self-defense. And it's, uh, and it's not, and it's not manslaughter. But if, 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 if they didn't accept that and you did... If you've gone over the what's top... The, what's if the you, charge, what's the charge... So, so obviously the murder is serious. It's a life sentence. But then, what's a manslaughter? Is that can be a life sentence? Um, oh, right, so it can be. That. Normally, the difference between the two would be that the the, the period would be slightly less, and it wouldn't normally be a life sentence. Uh, that's normally the big difference. Is that you've got to define. See, with a life sentence, as I explained earlier, you've got a minimum, but that isn't a guarantee you're going to come out. Then the craze got thirty years minimum. They never came out. I think they served forty in the end. And so, it's it, just as a well-known example, that's not uncommon. But wasn't that more of a political thing where they wanted to basically keep him in jail to say, this is what happens if you do this? Um, I don't think so. I, do, do you know what? The craze... If I was in government, I'd think, actually, we're making examples of these people because then people look at that and go, I don't actually want to die in jail. Do you know what I mean? It's a good deterrent. <laughs> it, it is, but, but I think... I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't know the answer to that. Because maybe... What I do know is the craze weren't the craze. What I do know is that everyone's... Remember, the way they've been built up in society is, is they, they were not the mafia. Yeah, they were they were a, an East London group, one of a number of East London groups. They weren't the dominant ones. They're just the ones who courted the media. They courted the media. They opened the nightclubs. They made themselves famous. And so they're remembered as being the craze. They were no bigger than the Richardsons and, and the others who were around at that time. But in retrospect, they're the ones who got the publicity. So maybe because of that, you might be right. Maybe that's why they got, maybe the government did use, an, did use them as an example because of what people thought they were, as so opposed to what they really were. I don't know any criminals that actually want to be be famous. No, <laughs> it would be. I mean, ultimately, it's, it was. It's a bit counterproductive, isn't it? It really is. I always find it whenever you see a criminal, whenever you see a criminal on TV or something who who's trying to be famous, you can be pretty much sure they're telling lies about what they've done. Um, not least because I mean, you read these books, don't you? You read books of uh, they've recently passed away, Dave Courtney. You read Dave Courtney's book, with no disrespect to the man, but he didn't do half the things he's claiming in the book. And I know that because I've defended half the people who did. And and and, and yet he wanted to be... There's a reason he wasn't arrested for any of those confessions that are in that book. It's because the police know that they're not true. Yeah. And it's so if someone is really putting themselves out there as being you know, the, the criminal about town, you can be pretty confident they're not. Yeah, it's, it's the quiet ones you've got to watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Uh, can you talk about any um, any any famous trials that you've you've done? I can talk about uh, yeah, I can talk. I can't talk about a number of. of, of I've got to be very careful. <laughs> yeah, of course. But I think the, the the ones I can talk about the things that that have been publicised by by the defendants. 
The most famous one of mine where 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 it's very much in the public domain would be Anthony Joshua. Um, when Josh was in 2011, so before the London Olympics, Josh was found with a sports bag full of cannabis on a car next in, on the car seat. I remember seeing that in the paper? Yeah. yeah, and it was quite a lot of cannabis and other paraphernalia. It was basically a um, prove you're a drug dealer starter kit. There's no possible way it was for anything other than that. And we had to defend him for that. And if he had been convicted of, of drug dealing, of drug supply, which was what he was charged with, um, he would not have been allowed to fight in the European Championship. He'd had his license revoked. And he had to fight in the European Championship to qualify for the Olympics. So if he hadn't done that, he would not have been in the Olympics. Who knows? He would have had a very, he would have had a very different career. I'm not saying for a moment that it, that, that it was a career that we are responsible for, but it would have been a very, very different career if we'd lost that case. Do you, I mean, what happened? Uh, I mean, do you think it was just, he was, he was in London and he just, like we was talking about earlier, you just fall into that wrong. Yeah. He, he, he grew up in a very, very, he grew up in the roughest estate in Watford. Uh, Watford is quite a rough place. I mean, it's, I'm not sure what his reputation is because I grew up not far from there. And everyone's, everyone where I grew up knew that where Watford is a rough place. It's got nice parts. Um, it's got the Grove Hotel, <laughs> but yeah, nice, yeah. it's got some, it's got some really not nice parts. He grew up in the not nice, not nice parts. He was also, in fairness, he was also training. To, he was pushing for the Olympics, so he was with Team GB, and you don't get paid. He, he was living the life of a professional boxer without the payment a professional boxer can expect for that. So you think he did? It was more more of a needed to pay for it rather than I think ultimately to be a drug dealer. Who knows? He got himself involved in something. He clearly was involved in it. He's very, very clear about that himself, um, which is why I can speak about it, because he's spoken about it. And uh, ultimately, what, for whatever reason he did it, he did it. But we went to, we had to go to court for it, and we couldn't plead guilty to something we should have otherwise been pleading guilty to. And I went before the judge and explained that to him. And I said, that you know we can't win this case. We can't win this as a trial. However... The consequences to this man that that will flow from this conviction are so above and beyond what anyone could consider would be the consequences of a conviction for a Class B drug. I mean, it wasn't a huge amount of cannabis, and and, and the sentences aren't that high. He probably he probably would have just about gone to prison for it. He may, he may he would have gone to prison for it, uh, but more importantly, he wouldn't have got in. He wouldn't have got his license back. Oh. It probably would have been the end of his boxing career after the, after his stint in prison. It probably would have done. And he could never have fought in America. And I explained all this to the judge. I said, this is a man who is a hair's breadth from being an Olympic champion. If he's an Olympic champion, he will be a world champion. There's no question about it. And you look at the state of boxing now, and I just said to the judge, yeah. take it from me, I'm an enormous boxing fan. He will be a world champion if he fights in the Olympics. Doesn't have to win the Olympics, just needs to do, do well. And he'll become a poster boy, et cetera, et cetera. I said, so you can either, you can either insist on the case going forward, we will have to fight it. We will therefore we will therefore get no discount for a guilty plea, and therefore he will go to prison. Once he goes to prison, the game's over. Never fight in America. Back then, America was a big thing. Yeah. He'll never fight in America. He'll never be able to do, et cetera, et cetera. It won't be in the Olympics. Who knows what, what will become of him? So that that's taken away a future that can't have been envisaged when they were saying what you should get for a particular thing. Yeah. So, if, however, you were to suggest to the prosecution that, that they should accept a plea to simple possession, then he won't go to prison. We will get his license back next week. He will be in the European Championships in a month. He'll be in the Olympics in a year. He'll be a world champion within five years. Much quicker, it turned out. He'll be a world champion within five years. And so more to the point, that's the effect just on him. More to the point, you can give him 360 hours of unpaid work, every minute of which he would have to spend in a boxing club teaching children to not make the mistakes he made. And you look at the the knock-on effect of that could be enormous. But well, we started, we were talking about this at the beginning. Exactly, we? precisely. Right. So, and that's uh, and the judge agreed. The judge turned to the uh, to the prosecution and said, I think everything he just said is eminently sensible. Go away and make a sensible decision. And the prosecution went away. And it's quite rare for a judge to do that. It's quite a brave thing for the judge to do because ordinarily they try to stay out of it. But when they do get involved, when they do sort of enter the forum, it does carry some proper weight. Yeah. Because don't forget, by this point, we'd already suggested all this to the prosecution and they just dismissed it out of hand. Understandably, because they said, well, he's guilty. 
So it's the one thing that always annoys me whenever I read about Josh. They always talk about his conviction for drug dealing. <laughs> doesn't have one. <laughs> and he doesn't have one because of a, of, of a very good day in court that we had. Yeah. But um, but yeah, it, that's that's the most famous one that I've been involved in. Probably one of the most minor cases I've done in the last <laughs> ten years. But but then was it? Is, is there any high profile cases uh, that, that you've defended and one that that was in the public domain that? You um, the the problem with that is if you defend them and you win them, no one really talks about them. If you defend them and you win them, they're, they're not noteworthy. All the cases you would think about now, if you were to sit, sit and think about the cases you know about, they're all with people who end up in prison. So if you're if you're defending people successfully, um, then then there's 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 no notoriety. There might be temporarily. There might be a couple of weeks where people are talking about it. I did a case that made the front page of the Sun, um, and no one can remember it at all. It involved Jack Wilshere, uh, the the footballer, the and well, the then England footballer, where he'd got in, he'd, he'd got everyone involved in a fight, and uh, and a poor girl got her arm broke, and bizarrely, everyone but him were charged. And I made the I made the trial all about him um, because he wasn't he wasn't even there. But we made it a trial of Jack Wiltshire because it really should have been. And I mean, what one of the questions I actually asked the you know, OAC, I found out the officer the officer in the case I discovered was an Arsenal fan. So I, well, when he was in the witness box, I actually I, I did the Mrs. Merton thing. So is there a reason as an Arsenal fan and an England fan that you decided not to charge the multi millionaire? Premier League Arsenal England player Jack Wilshere <laughs> with this offence that he clearly started, and and that all, I mean that made as I said, it made the front page of the Sun. It was all over the, the Mail and all the different papers, but nobody would remember that case happened because because we won, and it's they, they'll report it while it's going on. But the moment the moment it's no no longer a noteworthy um, a noteworthy verdict, that's forgotten about and it's tomorrow's chip paper. And then obviously uh, you've you've become this famous crime author um, under under the pseudonym of Tony Kent. Yeah. I mean, how did that come about, Tony? Was it, did you just come out what you were doing or did you just think, actually, I'm going to write a book? I always wanted to write a book. I always wanted to write, I always wanted to write something. I used to write scripts and films, film scripts, and I had no idea how to write them. I mean, I've, I've, I've now seen a lot of film scripts and they bear no relation to the shit I was writing. But as a kid, you just like, you have an idea what a script looks like. So I I love I grew up lo I love films I still love films I mean my my birthday present every year is an Every Man Cinema membership from my wife for me and my son and um and I, 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 there's no better night for me if I my two perfect nights are either front ringside at a boxing event or front row of the cinema so and boxing Usyk versus Joshua who wins no sorry Usyk versus oh. Fury no no sorry sorry Joshua's fighting in Ghana. Um, Fury versus Usyk, who wins? Fury versus Usyk. Um, we were talking about Joshua. We were. <laughs> uh, Fury versus Usyk. I would. It's got uh, for me Usyk. Really? I think he's in Fury's head. Um, I think that the size. Everyone talks about the size difference, and the size is bigger. But Fury's not as strong as Joshua. He's bigger than Joshua, but he's not as strong. The size difference between Usyk and Joshua was already enormous. It meant nothing. So why is the size difference from a man who is all right, a bit taller, but not as strong? I mean, but not as strong. Why is that going to make a difference? The other problem: music struggles with smaller heavyweights. Uh, sorry, um, Josh, uh, Fury struggles with smaller heavyweights. Look at Cunningham, and he is, for me, his worst performance was against a cruiserweight southpaw, a cruiserweight southpaw who doesn't have anything like the ability of this cruiserweight southpaw. I think everything from, and I think Uzik, and I think Fury knows it, and I think that's what's wrong with Fury. Right. It's Fury's ever since Uzik came on board, Fury's not been Fury. Think how popular Fury was about three years ago. Everyone loved him. Everyone loved him two years ago. Uzik came along, and Fury's behaviour since then has been so off the wall, and so blatantly trying to avoid that fight that it says to me he's in his head. And I think that Fury's a man who needs to be in the right head place. Yeah, interesting. See, I, I, I think. Fury's going to stop him. That's my, but but no, do you know, who no, knows? Do you, no, do you know, do you know something? We 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 we'll have a bet. We'll have a bet. Okay, we'll have a. Do you like? Do you, how do you have your coffee? I don't drink coffee. Okay, what do you drink? <laughs> Water or alcohol? Okay, perfect. So I'll buy you some alcohol. I so we'll have, have a, a whiskey bet. We'll have a whiskey bet. Okay, right. so a glass of whiskey. <laughs> yep. Whoever wins, we will do that. Yep. Um, but I'm saying Fury. You're saying who's it? What's great about it, though, is it's one of those rare occasions where it's a proper, proper fight. If you know about boxing, 
it doesn't mean you're all going to have the same opinion. Because quite often, m normally, when you have these conversations, you're talking to someone who, you, 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 if it's someone who knows boxing, you, you'll be saying the same thing. And then everyone else who just watches YouTube is talking shit. Because if you watch the, the last two fights, <clears throat> where Fury fought Ngannou and Usyk fought Dubois, right? Um, they, they, I think they both didn't look particularly great. No. No, I, right? I, I, I agree with that. And that's, yeah. that's kind of what excited me, in a way, about this. Because I, I genuinely think... <clears throat> Fury deliberately didn't put on a good show mm. because he wanted Usyk to go, I'm going to have this guy. And I think he saw the the shot. And, and you know, when when he fought um, White, he said, I'm going to hit him with the same shot yeah. that he got knocked out with before. And he did the same. So, yeah. you know, I think as a... And I also think what's good about Fury is <clears throat> he's light on his feet. He's fast. Yep. Yeah. Right? But I do get that when he fought... Uh, Cut, it was Cunningham. Cunningham, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was, that was a tough fight for yeah. him. So, I, but that's what makes it exciting. Right? It's exciting because it's because yeah. because actually, as I said, um, I've got my assessment of it. I know who I think, will, but I wouldn't be surprised if it went completely the other way. It would nothing but, would surprise but I me. I do about like Usyk. I do think he's an amazing fighter. So I'm not a non Usyk fan. Yeah. I'm, I'm I like both of them. But yeah, my money. If I was going to bet money on it, and I'm betting a whiskey on it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would be Fury. But let's go back to your, to, to the book. So so you you was talking about. Um, Obviously, you know, you you was writing scripts. Yeah, and you I was writing, wanted to write a book. And I didn't realise that books could be could be exciting because I, I, all I had was the books they gave us at school. And I'd re, I used to read military history, and I used to if I was going to read something, I used to read a lot of mythology, which was always like sort of because that was like old fashioned comic books, and um, and so I'd, I'd read a lot, but I wouldn't read uh, thrillers and crime because I didn't know they existed. I thought a proper novel was Wuthering Heights, which bored me to tears, <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> And then my mum gave me a book by a writer called David Baldacci, or Baldacci, I should pronounce it properly. She gave me a book called David Baldacci called The Winner. And I was completely, and I was reading it, just couldn't put it down, thinking it's the most amazing, I can't believe that books like this exist. And from the moment I read that, I was 17 years old, from the moment I read that, I wanted to be a writer. And so I decided that I was going to, David Baldacci was billed as being a lawyer writer, because uh, he was a trial lawyer. And, and then his book, Absolute Power, came out and he was billed as being these two things. He was billed as being basically what I actually do and he was sensible enough not to do. Uh, he wrote his first book. It was a worldwide bestseller, sold to Clint Eastwood to turn into a film. He never had to go back to court. He was, you know, he was a millionaire by, the point, by that point and he just became a writer. But that's not an interesting story, so they billed it as if he was both. I bought into it completely. I began bar school, uh, sorry, pupillage, and I thought... I'll do that. I'll do pupillage and I'll write my book. So I wrote the first, my first book's called Killer Intent. I wrote the first four chapters or three, three or four chapters the week before I began my pupillage, the week before I went off and started following Craig Rush around the country. And I was 22. I didn't touch it again until I was 30. Eight years went by before I went back to it because I just was too busy. I was building a career. I was in the Man United of sets, Two Bedford Row, we were incredibly busy. It was all front page news cases. I was completely and utterly wrapped up in that career. And then I had a long trial. I did think about the book a lot. I did always keep, keep thinking about it. And I kept writing other things. But then I had a long trial. And it was a long trial in which I had almost nothing to do because it was a, it was a big allegation. And my client was what we call Tail and Charlie. He was right on the end. And he only had involvement for about an hour on one day. So for this three-month trial, I had nothing to pay attention to for the best part of three months. And I got so bored after a week, I thought, I'm not going to be able to survive this. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to stay awake. So then I thought, that might keep me awake. I'll mess about on that book. So I messed about on that book whenever the trial wasn't about us. And by the end of the trial, I'd written it. And I enjoyed it so much that it took over my life. I enjoyed it so much that it was all I wanted to do apart from my job. I never lost any love for my job at all. I, I, I still love that. But I got I sort of developed this need, don't want to be pretentious or, or arty and farty about it, but a need to keep writing. Because when you walked in there earlier, I was a bit disappointed because I thought you'd have come in with a beret, the cravat, you know. Exactly. <laughs> The silk dressing gown. Get as pretentious as possible. <laughs> I'll get I'll get there. You'd have you know you have the little cigarettes, the long cigarettes. <laughs> but sell enough of these, I'll get well, I'll get very pretentious for you, don't worry. So so yeah, so I wrote that book, went through the process of getting it published. Uh ultimately it was published, I think published when I was 40. 
Um, and then my ne- they gave me an eight book deal, which is very unusual. And so I wrote, what well, they gave me a four book deal. The first did so, first two did so well that they then signed me on for another four while there were still two to come. And was the inspiration for the books from people you knew or people that you defended or was it just... Literally, just- one of them is, only one of them. The barrister character, there's two characters in my book. Um, I mean, I find this interesting up there because actually my main character is a guy called Joe Dempsey and I always refer to him as, as James Bond for the 21st century. It's James Bond with with some of the other stuff rubbed out that would no longer be acceptable. Right. Uh, it's it's in no way woke. Don't worry, it's not like that at all. But it's just, it's just, it's what I'm comfortable writing. I don't really write crime, pure crime, because I live pure crime, and for me, the writing is still a release. And if I had to write dark crime that I live every day in my trials, there'd be no off switch. So I actually write th- these are thrillers in the sort of, I guess. Jack Reacher sense, yeah, they're they're they're, they're more Jack Reacher than they right, are, right. than they are. Um, they're very they're, ironically, and this very book David Bodecci. is the brand new book from Tony Kent. It is the Shadow Network, and it's out on the fifteenth. It's and out on the fifteenth of February. Of February, but there is going to be a link below. So um, if you're if you've not read any of Tony's work, you can just click on that link and you see all of get them. involved. There's and five then, so far. Yeah. I'm writing the sixth as we go, as we speak. Wow, how long does it normally take you to write a book? About a year, all in. It takes me about two and a half months to write it. And then the process after that, you go back, it comes, it comes back and forth. I mean, you know yourself from scripts and stuff like that, where you, you keep going through drafts. Uh, but mainly there's, you. my main bit, bit is the writing. It goes off to my editor. She'll then send back a structural edit, which is all the stuff that doesn't work. Um, and her suggestions, you do all that, get that better. Then it goes back to her. And then it comes back for a copy edit, which is when you go through just to make it flow better. All the main stuff's done but it's just make it flow better. And then there's another edit called a line edit. I've got no idea what that's about. I never get involved in it. <laughs> they send me it and I say, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it is, I've got no, by that point I'm bored and I want to read the, write the next one. So, so you, obviously you're le- leading criminal barrister. You're, you're a best selling crime author. Um, is there anything else, Tony, that you're going to, you're working on or you're going to do or, <laughs> or is that keep you busy? No, it keeps me pretty busy. I think I've, it's a, I, I help run the law firm that I, that I help my, 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 that I help set up. Uh, when I decided to become a writer, I actually left the, the, the Man United. I chose to leave because I need, because there's no way that the time would have worked. Because when you're in the chambers, if you're not doing your own work, then you are, uh, then you're doing other people's. You're a team player. So I left that team. And I helped a friend of mine set up Ewing Law, which is a private criminal defence firm. And I set up, parallel to it, my own chambers. And we basically worked together on everything. And um, that, that the idea was that would allow me to do my own cases, and that was it, and nothing else. Um, and then I'd have time to write. As it turns out, it became so bloody successful <laughs> and so in demand that I now spend so much time working on all of that as well that I've probably got less time than I would have had. So the time management is difficult. So a third ambition is uh, is going to be difficult. And and have you got any children? Yes, I've got uh, one son. Oh, you've got a son? Yeah. Um, um, there's, I'm, I married my wife 10 years ago this year. Uh, it took us five years to get Joseph. Right. Uh, and now, yeah, now there's, there's three of us and a dog. And we all... And, we, and, he, and he, he's got a good right hook. Or is it a left hook? He's got a decent right hook. Uh, decent left hook, left probably. Hook. Decent left hook. Yeah, I didn't have you sap or off the option. <laughs> so go. Good overhand right. right. That's the important one. Yeah. <laughs> How would you refer to your wife? Because obviously she's got an amazing brand, but is she a designer or is she, is she the creative? What? She's the global brand ambassador. It's her dad's brand. Right, okay. And she's the global brand ambassador. It's, it's called Clive Christian. They started off with interiors, an interior, very famous for kitchens. Yeah. I think he invented, basically invented the idea of the kitchen island and the whole idea of the kitchen being a social space. And then they did it in a level that has really, chandeliers well, coming down. And, because I remember, and, and, and I'm saying... 15 years I might be wrong but I seem to remember that was when that brand really exploded where you know it was like the kitchen yeah you know what I mean if you had money you had that kitchen or, or you had yeah. your house design yeah um, exactly well, if you, if you, there's, there are films there's a, there's a particular film with Michael Douglas where he's playing I think he's playing a, a real estate person or, or there's a real estate person coming to see his house and the big thing they make of the house in LA is is oh that it's even got a Clive Christian kitchen so it's a big thing. It, it, it was a, a very successful company, and what her dad decided to do was to create was to expand it into a luxury goods brand, so not just design. Um, I guess probably because you can earn a lot more money with things in a box, can't you? 
And so he, he then bought the Crown Perfumery and renamed it Clive Christian. The Crown I saw, I've, saw, I've seen the perfume. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and, it, and they made the world's most expensive perfume. And that was my wife's main thing was the perfume. She went around the, she, she went to Fortnum and Mason as a sales girl. Uh, and then she took it to Bergdorf Goodman's in New York. She lived in America for 10 years, creating it as a national brand in America. And it's a, it's a very, very in-demand perfume brand around the world. So very different to what I do yeah. and, and a very no, different background. But, but I suppose it's good. That, I mean, it, it, must, it, it must be great fun for you as well. Yeah. So when you and your wife go out or you see what your wife's doing, it's probably a nice... It's, do you know what the least from, from when I when I was for the first 10 12 years of my career I was so wrapped up in it I think actually the books were one of the things that pulled me away and and, and I'm, I'm very grateful they did I was so wrapped up in it every girlfriend I had was a lawyer every I had one mate that wasn't a lawyer everyone else was a lawyer everyone I saw was a lawyer you live it and you can obsess with it and you can live it and breathe it and I did uh, and it's I still do with work but I don't, don't anymore with the lifestyle that went with it and I'm very grateful that I don't. And actually, she meeting Victoria and kind of coincided with the with with my first push to get published. And those two things, I think, are are, are, are a huge factor. Victoria more than the books. Mm. Uh, having a partner who isn't in the law and who doesn't want to sit there and talk about what what they argued that day and trying to outdo that, each suppose, other with suppose, war stories. I suppose if you married a lawyer or, or another barrister, it'd be a fucking nightmare, wouldn't it? I mean, you yeah, imagine the aggro. <laughs> Whereas, I put it to you. No, I put it to you. Victoria, Victoria's got this. Got this. She's she's got this technique to win now, which is she doesn't argue for the first argument. She'll have that argument a day later, while she's after she's had time to think about it. But the thing is, I'm quite mercurial and quite instant, and therefore, by the time she's ready to talk about it, I've I've got no interest in it at all. So it's it, it stops the rounds. Do you it's know, quite do good. You know, I don't know if you find this with your wife, but <clears throat> women, um, and, and you know, I find this with my wife. She she she's like they've got this sort of hard drive memory. So you'll be talking about something and she say, seven years ago, <laughs> three o'clock in the afternoon, you said this and you'd be like, what? Uh, irrita <laughs> ir irritatingly, to, even to, irritatingly for her, I, I'm the one who's got that. Oh, right, okay. She does have that to the same, she has that to the same level as most but women. You know, no, it's 10 past three. It wasn't yeah. at three o'clock. Well, no, she's got that to the same level as most women have it. But the problem is mine actually does work that way. Whereas I've discovered in life as women, a lot of people will argue about that will go into that level of detail. And, but when you check it, it's all wrong. You know? <laughs> Whereas I'm very lucky, very, very lucky, and probably why I do the job that I do. I do remember everything. I remember everything that gets said, everything apart from names. Terrible on names. But every if I have a conversation with someone, I'll tell you every word of it, and which is very helpful for remembering evidence. Yeah. And therefore, I realise whenever she does do that, I say, no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's completely wrong. <laughs> and obviously, that yeah, that 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 that. that makes for a very healthy relationship. Is her father still active with a brand or has he sort of stepped back and left? left? Um, yeah, he's still sort of semi-active with it. I think he's, does what you, I think he does what he wants to do. Yeah. She's, uh, she's, she's kind of part-time with it as well now. And what's the bit, what's the big push with Clive Christensen? Is it, um, is it still the kitchens? Was it interior design? Was it the perfumes? Was it everything? They, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, I think mainly the perfumes, mainly the perfumes, but I think there's, there's a lot of overlap with everything. They did handbags and stuff as well and did all these different things. But the thing is, it was, it was always to, to people of such levels of wealth that you're selling one very expensive thing rather than 100 medium Got things. So, you know, it, it's, and, and that, that's, that has an impact upon visibility. Yeah. So if you're selling a handbag for £25,000 to a billionaire, that's meaningless to the rest of us, isn't it? I mean, so you don't even know, the rest of us wouldn't even know they made handbags. I didn't even know they made handbags. Yeah. Well, I found out, <laughs> I didn't know they made handbags until I went to a friend of mine whose father was a billionaire. I went to her house and she had one. <laughs> Is that right? Okay, that explains it. So I take it, you smell good. You've got a great kitchen. <laughs> your wife's got loads of handbags. <laughs> Don't say but that. But she still says she's got nothing to wear. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that because this goes out and people might see on Instagram where I live. <laughs> oh, okay. I come looking for handbags. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, there joking. are no handbags in town. I'm only joking. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, but I mean, obviously, um, what one of the things um, that has become an epidemic in London over the past, well, I'd say probably, I mean, I, I was doing dance music events in the 90s and it was a problem then, but it just seems to be getting progressively worse. And that's obviously the knife crime. Um, I mean, do you find that you you do much of that or, or is it mainly, um, you know, the, the, because, because everyone sort of wants to solve it. It was obviously that young boy who got stabbed to death on New Year's Eve on Primrose Hill. Yeah. 
there's there's young kids getting stabbed to death and it just seems to be like and and you know from my perspective you know i've spoken to young people and i've actually said to them you know why why do you carry a knife and and it, and a lot of them say for protection and you sort of think what you know but how are you going to protect because when you pull that out if you use it and you kill somebody because you don't know where you're stabbing somebody they're going to probably die so you know and you're going to go to jail you know so I don't know how we how we solve it. I mean, have you? I think that the first thing I think you need to, we we need to do is to is to set the premise of what you can talk about. One of the main problems that I have always felt with knife crime is if you were to look statistically at knife crime, it is it's, there is statistically a race element to it, and no one's allowed to talk about it. And I'm probably going to be absolutely crucified for saying it now, but it's true. You've only got to look at it statistically. The vast majority of people being convicted of knife murders are black kids. Equally, the, mo the majority of the people being killed by knife crime are black kids. Until you can say that, you don't know what you're going to focus at. If you have cancer in your lung, you have to be able to say where that cancer is, don't you? You have to be able to say, oh, that's in the lung. It's not testicular cancer, it's lung cancer. You've got to identify it before you can look in to how to actually deal with it. Now, I can't claim to be an expert on anything about the culture that's breeding this. But I can claim to be something of an expert on criminal statistics and upon what I see in court and who I see for what offences. And I'm afraid there's no getting away from it. It is f f per head of population, uh, um, when you look into proportionally how, how many people the, the, the population goes, it's very, very heavily a crime of black youth. Now, until we can say that, how can we tackle it? Until we can say that, how can we tackle it? And I think the first thing we need to be doing is to deal with the black community in, 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 in terms of being able to say these things, in terms of being able to say to them, look, you're trying not to say something. You're trying not to say something in case you offend someone. I'd be far more offended that my son's been killed because it's the black kids that are dying. It's not just the black kids that are stabbing. It's primarily the black kids that are dying as well. And so your first point of call, it's not, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's only black kids. But when you consider the proportion of the population that is black and then the proportion of the population that is dying of knife crime and the proportion of the population that's being convicted of knife crime, it's very stark. And when it's that stark, you've got to surely be able to say it so you can then look into how you deal with it. And that, for me, it is an issue. I feel that there are certain politicians and there are certain public figures who get their position by being outraged about people talking about these things. And the reality is, if you were to talk to parents, to people who aren't on Twitter and to people who aren't on the news and to people who aren't in all these different places uh, screaming prejudice, racism, et cetera, et cetera, if you were just to talk to to, to the parents of these children, you would get a much more realistic view, a much more realistic take upon what they want done. Upon the fact that, you know what? Yeah, we do want our children safe. We do want our children, sod whether we're offended. We do want our children safe. I don't think anybody, I mean, the, the, real, the reality is <clears throat> nobody really cares what colour anybody is. Precisely. Right? It, it, to, to me, it's, um, it is an epidemic, and 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 it is a it is a it's, it's a problem because, you know, um, you know, in in the eighties and nineties, you you might get a smack in the mouth, you might get a bottle around yeah. the head, you might get a baseball bat around the head if you're unlucky. Yeah. But but now it's like if if, you know, I mean, my friend, <clears throat> he um, he's a crab Maga instructor, and he works with a man, and he said that you know he's teaching them how to stop people stabbing them inside, you know, yeah. in the armpits on their, because yeah. I know they wear in vests now. Yeah. So when they're tackling cr criminals, whether they're white or black, they're, they're, he's actually teaching them yeah. how to stop getting stabbed under, they, and, and, and if they stab you there, it's not to hurt you, it's to kill you. Yeah. So you sort of think, wow, you know, and, and a lot of people do give <clears throat> the police a hard time, mm. um, saying, oh, why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? But, you know, if I was a police officer and I was on whatever they get paid a year, and, I, and there's a chance that I'm going to get fucking murdered by somebody, yeah. I'm going to probably be a lot less um, likely to be grabbing older people in yeah. the street, regardless of whether I'm a police officer yeah. or not. So <clears throat> for me, 
Um, I think the only way it gets solved is they they just have to say, if you carry a knife, you're going to get ten years. I know it sounds mad. It's one of it's it's one of it's one of the solutions. Yeah. Part it's part of a solution. It's not a solution by itself. It's part of the solution. I think that to me would be a strong deterrent that if you're that you have to use it, just carrying it, that's what's going to happen. But then I don't don't disagree I think with that. The education that the actual yeah. saying, look, guys, if you got a problem with him, get in a ring and fucking sort it out, because otherwise you're going to jail for thirty years. And the problem with a lot of these kids and 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 uh, is is. And I think social media has a little bit to do with this. Mm. I think I think what it is, it's like, you know, you want to show everyone that you're living the dream. You've got the new trainers, you've got the watch, you've got this, you've got that, you've got the girls. Mm. So everybody's got this sort of ego thing on social media. And I think what happens with a lot of these, especially the street kids, right? Yeah. Um, they think that if they have an eye for a gun or they do somebody, then they get this rep. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've got a friend of mine who does a, a bit of stuff in prisons. Yeah. And he's actually said that, you know, you see these kids that have killed two or three people, whether they've shot them or they've stabbed them to death. Yeah. And they've got, you know, triple life sentences, that, you know, minimum 25, 30 years record, or whatever. And they're just walking around the jail like that, you yeah. know, like, yeah. And, and it's like, mate, you know, but when I get out, you know, it's like when you get out, no one's know you are, mate. Yeah. But the problem is they're sucked into this bullshit where they think that, you know, they have to do this, they have to do that. Yeah. And uh, I think that somehow has to be broken. And I don't know how you break that. But that, that that's, goes back to exactly, that's exactly what I, what, what, what I mean about being able to talk about where this is happening. I'm not suggesting for a moment this is just black kids. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that the proportionality of it is, is so stark that you can't ignore it. You have to be able to work out where you are before you can actually tackle it because nicking people and giving them 10 years because they've got a knife, I don't disagree with it. I don't disagree with it. But it's not the cure. You have to prevent. Prevention is the cure. And the prevention is the cure. And, the, and, and the, the, way, the way you prevent it is by changing the culture. And it's the culture of where this is happening. It's also predominantly a working class offence. I mean, it's very, very much a working class offence. You offense. don't see that many who so, are Henry stabbing each other. Definitely. Precisely. <laughs> so focus on that as well. But you have to be able to identify these different areas in which this is an issue. Rather than just saying it's an issue across society. It's not an issue across society. It's very much working class. There are plenty of white kids. Yes, there are. But there does seem to be this preponderance that I'm talking about that needs to be looked at because we won't understand it unless we can look at it. It's not acute. It's not saying they're doing th 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 this is something that's th th that should be, they should be vilified for. It's, so it's something that you need to be able to look at. And you, you need to know where you're... You can't look everywhere. So, for example, if, you, uh, if, if, you're, if, if you're at war with... With, with people with three eyes, you don't go off and say, right, but we're just going to check a load of two-eyed people as well, just in case. You know, you've got a limited amount of resources and you need to focus where you can put those resources. So you need to know where the problem is. I mean, there, there's there's obviously the knife crime has is, is become a massive issue. But then also I think a lot of crimes um, across the board, like you, you've heard about these people just running into shops, stealing stuff and oh, running yeah. out. And obviously the... Staff don't want to challenge these people yeah. in case they've got an iPhone. Yeah. Um, and then you've obviously got... It's a culture people. of fear. You get you get the burglaries, you get the street crimes, you get the Rolex robbers, you get all these different things going on, you get people stealing cars. I mean, what? because it does feel, and I don't know if it's just me, but, you know, you read what's in the news, but then when you talk to, like, I know several people over the last month who have either had their watch stolen... Yeah or their car stolen off their drive, or they've gone up to London and they parked their car in a secure car park yeah. with CCTV and obviously, you know, patrols, and they've had the windows put in and all their stuff stolen out of the cars. Yeah. And uh, it sort of just, it just feels like it's, the, the, the world's gone mad. Well, I think a, a huge part of it, a huge part of, of what you're talking about there, there, there is a criminal epidemic going on, in my opinion. There, there is, there is of more minor crime, no, it's not minor crime, ripping someone's thing off their off their wrist, but of the stuff that, that doesn't come to the likes of me. And that, I think, is is can be very, very much boiled down to the police and the police numbers. When the Tory party and the, and the, and the Liberal Democrats took over in 2010, they cut police numbers by 20,000. 20,000 police. That's cut. a lot of people, isn't it? Uh, well, it's I think there's 110,000 police in the country. So it's a huge, huge, huge... Huge bulk of them. 20,000 police officers gone. 
In what was that, the reason for that? Was it because they wanted to save money? or just Yeah, it was all about saving money. Everything was about saving money. They got rid of them. They also weren't recruiting as many afterwards. So, they, so, so, so there was less recruitment coming in. They also, and they never include this in the number that you get told, there was also the drop-off, the natural drop-off of people in that time. How many people retire each year, et cetera, et cetera. And there was an increased drop-off from people, from police officers who had just had enough because of the situations being created. So we are living in a world now where we've got probably, we, we, we were probably about 40,000 officers down at one point. They have replaced man for man pretty much all of them now, but only recently, only very recently. And when you look at the increase in population, particularly of London, since 2010, there's still less per head. There's still substantially, even though they've replaced that 20,000, let's say, there's still still far less head for head. Um, and again, another and, they also don't have the experience or the training. Yeah, these new ones that they brought in, you bring in a police officer now, he's no replacement for a DS who's got 20 years on the murder squad. He can't do what he can do. So you're not, man, it's not like for like, but they have replaced a certain number of them. But they're not, there's not enough of them and they don't have the resources. That's just not enough police officers to be able to, to man London. I mean, let's just talk about London because London's what we know. It's not enough people to man London. People are, there are criminals acting with impunity because they know that it's very unlikely that they are going to be pulled. Now, it also goes back, really, what we said about the drugs early on. You know, what, it, it, it's, the, it's the luck. It's a numbers game. It's a numbers game whether you'll get pulled in. It's a numbers game whether they'll open that car bonnet. It's a numbers game whether they're going to open the back of that van. It's a numbers game whether they're going to pull over that boat. Well, it's a numbers game whether the bloke on the moped with the machete who's coming off to take off your watch is going to get pulled. It's a numbers game. There aren't enough numbers on one side of that game. Do you, do you think members of the public should run run these people over on the mopeds? Do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably, that's probably a bit. That's probably a big decision to make if you've not if you've not carried would, out would the they, assessment. Would that? Would they, but but would that would that be self defence if the guy had a machete? <laughs> if, a, if the guy's got if the guy was coming at you with a machete and, and, and you think he's going to get in your car, then yeah. It's, you know, there's, it's, it's all different not circumstances. Not that we have a cat. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's all different circumstances. Right. I mean, the circumstances being what they are, you just say, I mean, it'd, it'd, be impossible, it'd be impossible to say, but there are circumstances in which that would be self-defence. I mean, I, I don't even know where these machetes have come from because they come out of nowhere. the zombie knives and all this sort of stuff. The last, the last 18 months. Do you think it's come. like a fashion thing or do you think it's I think just... it's massively a fashion thing. I think it's huge. It's also, a, also a, a, another version of that numbers game. One gang's got them, the other gang has to have them. Otherwise, you're the lesser gang. It's a fashion thing. It's also a survival of the fittest thing. And again, it goes back to culture. It goes back to, to the criminal culture in, in certain pockets um, that we need to deal with. Yeah. And, we, and we can't pretend they don't exist. So, 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 so do you think it needs to really come from government or do you think it, it, it needs to come from the Mayor of London that, to, to kind of start? Because cause, cause if you look at the country as a whole, the whole country is having these issues. It's not but, just London. But in the actual cities, I think if you start in the cities first, I mean, would that be a... It's, a, it's definitely the cities because yeah. everyone's crammed in. Everyone's crammed in you have greater poverty in the cities. And it's uh, poverty is a big part of this. Um, there, there's, I think that you're, there are a number of things that need to be done. I don't think you can identify which politician, whether it's Parliament or the Mayor of London. I happen to think the Mayor of London is a complete and utter weight of space, but I can't blame him for this. He's got nothing to do with Manchester and they're having murders up there. They've got a good mayor and they're still having murders up there. I think there are so many things that need to be done. We need to shore up policing. We need to change the culture of policing. We need to change the way people look at police. But you also need there to might, change... There used to be a massive respect. Yeah, there? there's no respect I mean, for growing police Growing up now. as a kid, you know, you saw the police and you, you stand up straight, you know what I mean? You, you, you think... Too many people uh, now will take, the, will take their child's side against the police. Well, he said that, so you're, I want to complain about you. And, and, and I, you see so, so, that the police are on, I'm not saying they're perfect, they're very far from perfect, but they get put on the market cross for quite a lot of things that they don't deserve to be on there for. I mean, it's quite easy just to make an allegation against a police officer and then suddenly they're, they're suspended. We don't have enough of them as it is. Well, we had a, we had a lady uh, called Nikki Perfect. Um, she's come on the podcast and she she's a hostage negotiator but she was the head of the firearms um and she's been in the in, in the met for years and uh she sort of said you know when the firearms officers discharge a weapon yeah. 
they that's them off. They're off and they have to be investigated. And I was like, well, that doesn't that sort of mean that they're less likely to pull the trigger? I mean, if you get the call and you're starting to put bullets in guns, yeah. I mean, it's obviously a problem, right? But having said that, on the other hand, maybe that couple of seconds to, to consider do, is this necessary are necessary. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, two, there's two ways to look at it, isn't it? Does it delay them? Or does it actually make give them thinking time they wouldn't otherwise have? I mean, it's it's there's no there's no clear answer to anything. What is very clear is that there are so many questions. Yeah, it's no there may not be clear answer to any of them, but we we we've got to do something. And num police numbers, police culture, police respect, and then on the other hand, we spoke at the beginning about the boxing clubs. It's not just boxing clubs. Open football, football should be doing more. Professional football should be doing so much more. If you look at what professional rugby does, and there's no money in professional rugby, but the way they behave with the children is incredible. I used to tra train down at London Wasps with my little brother. Um, he was a kid, and, and we used to have Lawrence Delalio come down on a Sunday if he wasn't playing. He'd come down and train with the kids. And and just like one example, there'd be loads of them. Go to a football club, you don't get any of that. The football the footballers have no interest in, in stuff like that. I This is, this is anecdotal, so I won't say the names of the players, because uh, who knows, but I was told by somebody whose job it was to do PR for Chelsea that back in the day, her main part of her job was um, was cutting and pasting into images players as if they'd been there to the charity events for the kids. They said Peter Cech apparently would always turn up and most of the time he'd be turning up on his own and they'd be putting out pictures with other people in the background as if they were there too. Do you think too. if you was on 800, 200 grand a week, whatever they get paid, you think you want to give a little bit back? Yeah. But, but but what I say about football, I, I mean, I don't mean the footballers. I mean the football league and the club. They they don't. They're only interested in the business side of it now. So if a kid's exceptional, he gets he gets pulled away. So all right, he's gonna have a great life. He's pulled away. He's in the club at t ten years old. He's not on the streets anymore. But there's no one there putting on football for the other kids that aren't going to be professional. It's almost as if it's professional or sodger. Whereas the amount of money they got involved, they should be a responsibility for them to to be having putting on facilities for the kids that aren't going to go and play for them. I definitely think sport is definitely a gateway into solving a lot of these problems, whether it's darts, whether it's boxing, whether it's football, whether it's rugby. Yeah. Um, but like you said, giving uh, the, youth, give the youth uh, or people that aren't working an opportunity to actually do something. Yeah. and uh, Somewhere to go, somewhere to keep them occupied, something to look up, look up to your coach instead of the drug dealer with the watch. Back to what we said at the beginning. And then, and that, that's and that's your key with, with with the culture. One of the keys with the culture. There's so much more that needs to be done. So I've got an idea. Why don't I run for Met London Mayor, <laughs> and you can be my crime czar? <laughs> I'll be up for that. You got you got my support. You got my vote already. Or, or you anyone could, who's not or, who's or not Sadiq Khan's got the, my vote. Or you could be the. <laughs> Uh, con is it the consigliere to the mayor? You know, <laughs> so you make sure that all the laws are. <laughs> we are Tom Hagen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but genuinely, you know, I th I think uh, I think a lot of stuff we talked about today. I think a lot of people that are listening to or watching this will it will resonate with them. Mm. And uh, you know, again, is there's a lot of work. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it, because the government always get blamed. Uh, whoever's in power, it's like blame them. It's their fault. But. Um, obviously, the, the, if, if you look at the UK as an infrastructure, yeah, there's so much stuff going on, and it's so difficult to to run, you know. And and I think you rely on so many people, yeah, uh, on that on that network. Yeah, know? no, I, I agree with you. It's it's it, it the, the the break the breakdown isn't just at the top. The breakdown is in many many different parts of the entire overall structure. The top doesn't help. Don't get me wrong, but the the breakdown is across the board. And there are a lot of people out there who want to help. There's a lot of people out there who want to give their time, but they need to know where to give it and how to give it. Well, that that boxing uh, box charity, clever, yeah, that boxing mm. charity box clever that you were talking about earlier. I think I think that I think they should definitely. I mean, I'll definitely be up for helping out and pushing that in any way I can. And uh, yeah, I mean, it'd be it, you know, it's 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 been good having you on today, Tony. Because uh, that's been a pleasure. Thank uh, you. <laughs> having a chat to you and find out about your career and. You know, I suppose anybody watching this that's 17, 18, 19, that's bright, that's thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do in my life. <laughs> you know, Tony's done it. So, uh, you know, John Cooper, you know, has done it as well. Yeah. But he was in Birmingham, you know, he's uh, working class. Yeah, again, I, I, you know? I, I, sh I should say, I mean, I always tell the story about, about what my belief was when I was a kid. 
there's plenty of working class barristers. Plenty of there's plenty of us. I mean, I'm not. I'm nowhere in any way an anomaly. There's plenty of us. I just didn't know. <laughs> and, if, and if you was going to give our, our viewers and listeners any advice, what would you what would you give them? Any advice generally in life, or <laughs> just 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 in general? Would you just say no comment, or what would you? <laughs> <laughs> Depends if you have a defence or not, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I think I, I don't. I don't know the answer really because it's just such a wide that, thing. But... You know, if, if someone, if if you know, if, if you imagine right, um, people watch this, yeah, um, and you know, it, it, for, for twenty twenty four, what yeah. would you? What would be your 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 positivity quote that's got you through? You I know, think do what life. you love and love what you do is yeah. ma is the main thing. I think there's is it Confucius. I think it might be Confucius said that if you find a job you love, then you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. Um, he was full of shit because I'm knackered most of the time. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, I do love it. That's it still work, but I do love it. Well, Tony, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Really good to meet you. Angie. Thanks for tuning in to the Criminal Connection podcast. Tony Wyatt, what an amazing guest. Make sure you check out his books under the pseudonym of Tony Kent and make sure you like, subscribe and tell all your friends about the Criminal Connection. And make sure you tune in next week. We've got another outstanding guest. We'll see you on the other side. <laughs>